the Carolina Hurricanes became a thing in 1997. You know what wasn't a thing? Hockey in North Carolina. It is now, but trust me, it was not in 1997. Despite all the local hype that arrived the day it was announced, the Hartford Whalers were relocating to Raleigh. It was all the area's hopes for hockey under one tent. The governor and every elected official you could shake a hockey stick at gathered for the big announcement. Centennial Authority Chairman Steve Stroud started it off with glowing words for the newest business owner in town and his signature on the deal. Uh, what, a, what a great day this is for North Carolina. Peter Kamanos is a gentleman, he's a man of his word, and I'm indeed proud to sign this memorandum of understanding. Carmano still has to finalize an agreement to get out of Hartford, but it won't stop the Whalers from heading south. In the worst case, we would still play one more year in Hartford and then come to Greensboro the year after that. All right, uh, the league just, and, and I agree totally, uh, want to make sure that we comply with every legal requirement we have. People are still wondering if hockey will catch on in the triangle, but the triangle has apparently already caught on with the players, players who have had a rough time until they got the word. There were a couple of hoots at the end, and uh, that's a fair amount of emotion for, for people who've kind of been through a number of situations. I, I, they're excited, without question. Behind the scenes, understandably, there was a lot of uncertainty for key personalities that would become a part of the Carolina Hurricanes fan experience, including television play-by-play -play man John Forslund. Now, we know John as an incredible ambassador for the franchise, a huge part of why fans felt so connected to this team. But in 1997, Forslund wasn't so sure where any of this was going. The Triangle has the most unique landscape for sports. Three major universities along Tobacco Road with rabid band bases, a Stanley Cup champion, an NFL team right down the road, and heavily invested transplants. Not to mention an interesting mix of sports teams that were. Joe Ovius brings you a brief history of Triangle Sports, a candid conversation with those who help shape why sports matters here. I feel like your your play-by-play -play origin story, John, is very similar in the, in the sense that you have you have this appreciation for the game, like a lot of other people, and you get yeah. into it at an early age. But something clicked for you where you wanted to start calling the game. So you you started calling the game when you were what around twelve years old off of television. Um, I I, I believe I was I was uh, let's see nineteen. I was eight years old. Okay. I was eight years old when I, I recall getting the, the bug for it, Joe. So that would have been in 1970. Bobby Orr scores the iconic goal for the Bruins, and they beat St. Louis. They win the Stanley Cup. Mother's Day, May 10th, I know exactly where I was, uh, 1970. Um, I was at my aunt's house. Uh, other people that were there, which is my family, were in other rooms. I was alone watching Dan Kelly call that game on television on a Sunday afternoon on CBS. It was the cadence of the play-by-play -play that kind of hooked me into wanting to formulate this hobby of mine, which I did throughout my formative years uh, as a teen and so on. And like a lot of people that get into this, you're a super fan and you really immerse yourself in this hobby, which was calling games off the television. And then how serious do you want to take the hobby, which I took it very seriously. My mom urged me to do a lot of research and read for academic reasons because I wasn't a great reader. Mm -hmm. um, I would get bored and you know put it away and not do it and all those kinds of things. Um, like I'm sure you did, listen to radio as a young boy in bed when you're supposed to be asleep. Listen to the overnight talk shows, I believe Pete Frank Cleveland and Cleveland had this amazing signal that reached uh, our area of the country. You could hear sports talk at all hours of the night, uh, get as many games in over the airwaves as possible, formulate in your mind what you think you're doing. So it's kind of a unique thing. Um, and then over time too, my dad became a big uh, ally in terms of pushing me, very positive guy, uh, was my color man for many years by my side in the family room, as we called the Bruins games off the television. Mm -hmm. His 
buddies would come over our house for whatever reason had the antenna that could draw the signal in basically as uh, clear as pictures you could get in western Massachusetts about 90 minutes away from Boston and we do the games and they'd sit around and have a few beverages and laugh and Johnny would call the games and my dad would do the color and I always joke that I fired him when I was 16 because he wasn't prepping enough for me. But I've dealt with partners like that along the way, Joe. I've had I've had some that uh, have, have uh, opted for that type of a mindset. Um, but anyway, I, I put it in my back pocket. I went to college, and I had no idea I was going to get into this. And then I took one course in broadcast, and I had some great advice from a news director of an NBC station, a local station, who in my junior year of college offered me a job on the spot wanted to make me an anchor uh, for one of their sister stations, which would have meant leaving school, and I wasn't going to do that. Um, but he also told me, if you get a chance to do this, go for it, because you cannot be taught this knack you have for narrating a game. And that was a voiceover of the 1981 Super Bowl that I did a simulated broadcast. So anyway, that's kind of how it started for me. Thank God it did. Uh, it's been a labor of love, and I'm very lucky. And you were you were play-by-play for the, the old Springfield Indians yeah. uh, starting in 1984. But – as you as you did that and you found your voice and and you you know you developed what you were trying to do you took a job with the Hartford Whalers not as a broadcaster uh, you, you you were the PR director so what what happened right. what happened in you know did you did you did you run into a stumbling block did you think this was my next step to get to the next step how did you end up with the yeah. Whalers well the stumbling block was no jobs Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, I had a life lesson and, um, Natalie and I got married in 1986. Uh, we met in December of 1982 and she was with me for the ride, you know, on my way up and she knew what my dream was. Mm -hmm. And she had a full-time job coming out of college and I had a full-time, full-time job, which meant I worked about 90 hours a week doing a variety of jobs for minor league team and got little or no pay really when you look at the time put in. And I'm not alone. Everybody does that, right? Oh, this, this so, sounds very similar to me and Kelly uh, where, yeah. you know, she, she goes off to, to become a lawyer there. We have that. Con I think everybody in this dynamic has that conversation with a spouse. Hey, um, how serious is this going to be? Or what's the next step? Because, and I was working at 8.50 the buzz as a part-timer. Either this radio thing is going to work or it's not. What are we doing here? You had a similar conversation? Yeah, and I was working for the Springfield Indians, which was my boyhood team, which mm -hmm. was the team that I followed as a, as a young guy growing up there. And my dad and I would go to all their games every weekend. They played Friday and Saturday nights at home. We go to many, as many games as possible, and that's how we formulated this great bond that we had. As my He was my best friend. So... Um, to, to work for that team was a dream come true only for me. Most people in and around my family had no idea or under had any understanding of what I were, was doing. Um, I didn't really grow up in a hockey family. Um, and most of my cousins and, and extended family loved other sports, but nobody was a hockey fan. Um, I was like an outlier. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but my wife, would get questions from her people, my people, and behind my back, you know, when's John going to get a real job? You know, those types of things. And uh, I thought I had a real job. You can relate to this, right? Oh, if you're working. This, this sounds so familiar, John. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, you know, when, when's this going to happen? <laughs> and to her credit, she said, leave him alone. Mm -hmm. he, he loves what he's doing. And she might have thought it herself. But anyway, after seven years – and countless rejections and a couple of situations. There was one in New Jersey. There was the San Jose job. I thought I had a really good chance. I had won awards in the American League. I thought I was next in the pecking order. It wasn't happening for me. The only thing I wasn't very good at, and still maybe to this day, I'm not a very good self-promoter. Um, I didn't play the politics game very well. Um, I think that hurt me early in my career. Um, but anyway, uh, Hartford, Jimmy Roberts, uh, late great Jimmy Roberts was the head coach of the Indians. He was going to be the head coach of the Whalers. And he had good relationships there with everybody with Hartford. And so did Bobby Orr. And it's funny that Bobby Orr scores this iconic goal in 1970, which kind of turned me on to the game. And then I got to know Bobby Orr personally because he was on the board of directors of the Whalers. He got to see my work in the minors. He recommended me to the ownership and the GM at the time for a job. Mm -hmm. Now, initially, I was going there to be Chuck's partner on radio, 
and work in the hockey operations department as an information director. They wanted to split PR and hockey information into two, two jobs. They wanted the PR guy to work with business. They wanted me to work on hockey uh, situations. The PR director had been there for a while, uh, really got angry with this, didn't like the fact that I was joining the team and quit. And when he quit, I got another phone call from the owner at the time who uh, brought me off vacation from Maine, brought me to his house in Connecticut and offered me a PR job, which was a very substantial salary, which was an executive position, full benefits, 401k and all these different things I didn't even know about. And I had to grab it. So I did, but I did it under the auspices of I'm going to do this for a short period of time. And I kept my hand in broadcasting. I freelanced. I did games for sports channel, American league game of the week and so on on television. Um, and then when ownership changed and the Carmanis group came in, they wanted me to continue as a PR director. And the funny story is that they almost fired me. The previous owner wanted to fire me for being a negative individual when I was basically a realistic individual. And a lot of their ideas, marketing wise, I would poo poo because they wouldn't fly. And I had the back of my GM and coach and they didn't like that in those marketing meetings. But anyway, that's a lot, another story. But the Carmanis group wanted me to continue as a PR guy. I said, I'll do it for one year. I want to be a broadcaster. And anyway, they, uh, Jimmy Rutherford kept that in mind and then some changes happened and then Jimmy gave me my chance so I owe him a great deal that was in 1995 But it was a short-lived stint as the voice of the Hartford Whalers because you move yeah. in 1997. So yeah, I, I you know with the Carmanos group and everything else, I am I am curious. I don't think people quite, as we've gotten further away from it, how contentious 1997 was uh, it, mm-hmm. the the move in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And I think you've described that last broadcast. I think it was against the Lightning, right? Um, yep. The last game for Hartford um, was almost cathartic, I guess, because this, this was it for a team that wasn't necessarily historically great, but loved in the city, uh, and it was right. being taken away. So kind of take us back to 1997 and that final game. That was really hard. And that was hard because you had to be a pro, you had a job to do. Uh, you had a ton of emotions. Um, there was some excitement, a, a, a backdoor excitement in terms of a new frontier that we were going to, mm-hmm. to be lucky enough to be included in that. Not everybody did. Mm-hmm. You were leaving behind some great friends that you worked with. You were costing some people income, like the people that worked on our shows, um, They had the Celtics, they had us, and now we were leaving. They were left with the Celtics. There was a huge void there. You were leaving a fan base that was pretty passionate, been uh, kicked around a lot, had been told if they filled the building, the team would stay. To this day, I don't think that was a lie. I think that was the intention. Uh, the, The local government, the state government was not interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, Connecticut's a small state, but it's governed uh, in two in, a, in two ways, really. There's Northern Connecticut, Southern Connecticut, and Southern Connecticut, as you know, is basically a suburb of New York City, and there's a lot of money there, and the governor at the time was getting a lot of his uh, support from that area of the state, and they didn't really care about Hartford. That was the bottom line. They, they, it didn't matter. And it was only an hour's drive, sure. but they, did, they, didn't, they didn't care. It was so provincial and, and New England's a, really a small area in terms of geography, but uh, the boundaries, if you go from Massachusetts to Vermont, it's like you're going to another country. It's uh, especially back in those days. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, so uh, this was a, this was a tough uh, day. It was a tough day because uh, um, of the finality of it all. Now it was real. It's like a bad dream. Um, um, and how do you, how do you do this? You know, how do you not get lost in emotion? You're going to get choked up. You're going to sound sappy. You're going to say the wrong thing. Are you going to tick off the owner of uh, your boss? Is he going to get angry with something you say? Is that going to affect your career moving forward? Um, 
I didn't have the, the, you know, the, the presence or the experience to just say whatever I felt hadn't been there long enough. I was there long enough. I think for the fans to appreciate us in a short period of time on television, Chuck was different. Chuck was there from the beginning. Yeah, since 1979. You know, he like, yeah. He was an iconic figure on, on radio there. And I came in and uh, at first there was a newness to it. And people were like, I don't know if we like these guys. Myself and Daryl Ray were the first two that in 1995, 96. And by the end of that season, people really enjoyed our broadcasts and the critics. There was media critics back in those days in the sports pages. And um, they they killed us at the beginning and, and they loved us at the end. And that was just one season. Yeah. But this was a couple of years later in 97. So that was, uh, that was tough. And then the fear of the unknown, like what are we actually getting ourselves into? We had no idea. So you've got, you go from that surreal moment where you're closing things down in Hartford to starting – in Greensboro. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. PNC Arena, then the Raleigh Entertainment and Sports Arena hadn't been built yet. You had to do that stint in Greensboro. Um, take me to that first broadcast. Did you have like a what the hell moment? Yeah, yeah it was a joke. It, it really was. Okay. It, because, first of all, I'm not sure many professional franchises have moved in four months. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not an expansion team. So you, you look where I'm at now in Seattle. There was a two year buildup for this. There was a totally different world in terms of social platforms and everything in terms of promotion and organization and everything's buttoned down and right and launch it and away you go, everything's mm -hmm. great. We didn't have an arena. Uh, we were new to the area. We came to Virgin Territory. Um, North Carolina in 1997 was way different than North Carolina in 2022, like mm -hmm. a night and day difference. Uh, you've seen it. Um, it's amazing how uh, things have transformed. Some for the good. Some things are not so good. But um, it was it was just so different to us and foreign. And we felt... I don't want to say like outcasts, but in the National Hockey League we were. Yes. Because we were villains, and Peter Carmanis was uh, vilified for that. He was a monster. He, he was this guy that, you know, had his own self-interest and shunned all those people. And ESPN in Bristol, Connecticut in 1997, you know, they're important now. Do you know how important they were then? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, they were not on our side. Like they enjoyed coming to the games for free and, and sitting in the press box right. and, and, and the whale and kicking the whale a little bit and, and having fun with the whale that play in a mall and all these different things. And then the whale left. Oh, we love the whale. All the way, except for Chris Berman, who was a whaler fan through and through. Um, but I mean, you know, this was, we were the villains and now we're coming to North Carolina and people were asking us why we were there. You know, it's not a lot of fun when you go to a new place and you have a professional major league team, you feel, and you get to an area and they're like, why are you guys here again? What is this? And then there were some people that really loved it. And a lot of people that drove from Raleigh to Greensboro, but we had to get going in that arena. That was really hard. And uh, they were still building and finishing off the locker room on opening night. Yeah. There, were, there were carpenters in the room when Paul Maurice was giving the pregame speech. I mean, you know, you go to the mascot store, you go to all these different things. I mean, it was a calamity. It was it was really crazy. But then uh, those two years, we managed to get through it, open the building in Raleigh, and, and, and away you go. But uh, it was a very difficult time and unsettling. And for us as a family – I had a one-year-old, and Natalie was eight months pregnant when we moved. Um, and we had to come down, and she was, uh, you know, one month away from having Matthew. And uh, we had to come down to North Carolina, find a place to live, find a doctor, a uh, young couple, um, man. And again, leaving all of our people, uh -huh. all of our extended family in New England. And some of those people were like, yeah, have a nice time down there. You know how it is. And uh, like, Hey, I didn't, I'm, I feel lucky. I'm continuing my career. I had a chance to go with the Bruins. Uh, didn't work out just before that, but, um, I owe Jimmy and Jimmy put a little muscle on me to say, Hey, come with us, please. I think you, you owe it to me. Cause he did give me my chance and I'm so happy he did because we had a wonderful time in North Carolina. That's that's what I was curious about, because it's it's easy to – this is not what you signed up for. You're a New England guy, right? Right. right. And you said it yourself, right, at the beginning. You're a hockey guy uh, from a family that didn't quite understand it. So now you're not just uh, – you're moving to an area that hadn't really learned hockey yet. 
and you're dealing with what, 10,000 people at best showing up to Greensboro. And even yeah. in the, I mean, not to get, even in the success of what the 98 season, was it the 90, was, was the 98, 99 season where they make the playoffs um, yeah. in Greensboro. But then even that is struck with tragedy uh, with, with Steve right. Chason. Uh, so with Steve Chason. So I, I, from your perspective, how close were you to not sticking it out with Jim Rutherford? How close were you to thinking, you know what? I just don't, this isn't what I wanted. And maybe look for another gig somewhere else in a traditional hockey market. Right. And I'll never forget. We had an, an organ, an organizational meeting before we left Hartford conference call with Mr. K. So Peter Carmanis is addressing the group that's going to North Carolina. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'm never going to put in the players were included in this. I'm never going to put any of you people or your families in a bad spot. Trust me. And all of us went, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't believe him either. Okay. And then when we, I had one year left on my deal when we moved there. And then that first year we were supposed to do most of the games on television. We did 29 games on TV. Now, being in New England and being in Hartford, the good thing about Hartford is it's a small market, but it is wedged between Boston and New York. There's a high level of visibility. Um, in those days, you had to be seen to have a chance at a career. We didn't have the point of view presentation we have today where every game basically in any sport can be a national telecast because you can get it on your phone. Right. Uh, then you needed a satellite dish with coordinates to pull in a game. You needed a reel. You needed somebody to see you. Um, I was starting to freelance for ESPN in Hartford and do the playoffs for them. I didn't know if that would continue. I felt like I was in a broadcasting black hole for hockey. I felt like, you know, what, what should I change sports? I, I, I put my foot in the pool with a little bit of college basketball for, with Fox because I wasn't doing a lot of hockey and I needed something to do. I would sit in with Chuck, but that wasn't going to get me anywhere. So I did wonder, what am I doing here? I'm glad you asked this because I haven't really talked much about this. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't I didn't know uh, what was next until I met with Jimmy. And Jimmy brought me in and uh, he gave me my first long-term deal. Mm -hmm. And he's, and he, and I can't speak enough for Jim Rutherford. Um, obviously fans will always have positive and negative takes on whatever GM does. Um, but he really looked after me. He, he knew that what I wanted to do, uh, he gave me a lot of positive feedback in terms of how I do my job, but most importantly, he backed it up with years of security that he gave me at a very important time. So we could lay down roots and we could start this mission, this, this journey with the team. So I made a decision and we were going to stick it out. And after we got there and we got to see what North Carolina was all about, we looked around and said, wow, this is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And we got out to apex and there was nothing there. And that's why we went there. And we were like, wow, this is tremendous. And now we can't even can't even breathe in Apex, you know? So um, it's, uh, it, it, everything happens for a reason. And I'm, I'm lucky that it did. I want to fast forward to 2002 when the Canes finally break through and they surprisingly show up uh, in the Stanley Cup finals against Detroit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, the, the overtime game. Pivotal game three here at the Raucous ESA. The Hurricanes leading 2-1 late in the third. Nicholas Lindstrom fires. Brad Hall redirects and scores. 1-14 left in the game. Tied at 2-2 going into not one. Not two into a third overtime. With both teams exhausted. 41-year-old Igor Lariana skating in on Artur Zerbe. He scores. 5-13 left in the third overtime. Detroit wins at 3-2. They lead the series two games. Games to one coming into the night's game four. What if the Canes had won that game? They win the Stanley Cup. You so you okay? So you're you're on board with that hype because I, I I asked Chuck Caton that same question 
about that particular game and what fortunes change if they actually win the overtime game? Because you know, we we have what happened in Detroit and everything else. So you think they win it? You don't think I you really don't think do. Detroit was still good because Chuck's contention was that Chuck Chuck's contention was that Detroit was still so talented they could have they overcome were. that. They, they were and and they might have been able to, but my recollection of Game Three was that the Hurricanes were the better team in that game, and that was a swing game. The unfortunate occurrence was that it went so long, mm-hmm. and Paul kind of boxed Paul Maurice kind of boxed boxed himself in by not utilizing his fourth line at all. He, he and I don't blame him because against that team, it was really hard to put those guys out on the ice, and. Um, Jeff Daniels might have been part of that. I, I I don't have a good enough memory to tell you. Tommy Westland, I I, I uh, who the fourth line was. Kevin Adams might have been in that mix. They sat there for the better part of two periods without playing, and then in the third overtime, I think he had to get him out there because he, you know, we're they're running on fumes, and so I think that Detroit team was so battered up, including Iserman. They needed Iserman couldn't even walk, but he could still. <laughs> Right. Remarkably, he could skate, but he couldn't even walk. Mm-hmm. Um, the next day, the off day between games three and four, if you walked to the rink and watched the two teams and the dynamic, you knew the series was over. You knew the will was gone with the Hurricanes. They needed every ounce of it, plus heroic goaltending from Herbe. Um, and they kind of got in Hoshik's kitchen a little bit in that series in the first couple of games. They could have won game two. Mm-hmm. Marty Jelena took a bad penalty or it was a bad call. They both go hand in hand. Um, and that kind of swung that game around in game two. They were on their way in game two. So for the lion's share of three games, I thought they were the better team. But then that changed. Detroit looked like a brand new group. Their older guys had a lot of zip. Brett Hall and Larry Onoff and Shanahan and Iserman, Luke Robitaille, and the collection of players. I think it was a $70 million payroll against a $30 million payroll. Um, that's how we got to a lockout, the big one. Um, but anyway, I think that that swung the entire thing around. They should have won the cup. They were the better team. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't always mean you're going to win a playoff series. Of course not. Right? And, and the Canes had some magic uh, potion going there, and they could have pulled it off. Well, that's, that's when we fast forward to 2006, where the Canes mm-hmm. were the better team, talent-wise. They were in position. Right. They made moves to get better in the course of the regular season, coming out of the lockout, taking on the yep. eighth-seed Edmonton Oilers. So uh, I'll pose this question uh, in a different way. Were you surprised that the Carolina Hurricanes were able to rebound in game six in Edmonton where they lost? And I remember being in the locker room and everybody looking dejected, coming home for game seven and actually winning it. Because if you're the eighth seed and you've gotten this far, you start to believe. And if you're on the other end, you could get really down on yourself. Are you surprised the way the Canes came out in game seven in 2006 to win it all? No. There was nothing about that team that surprised me after watching them go through 82 games. That was such a special, special group in terms of their chemistry, their camaraderie, um, the oneness that uh, the oneness that uh, Peter Laviolette was able to foster with that team. So, and they were also so great at coming back all year. So they had already shown us, you know, what they could do. And so when they got in that predicament, and I'll, I won't forget the flight home ever because the flight home the next day, for whatever reason, the way the plane was configured, our seats faced these two grizzled guys who sat in the very front of the player group. Mm-hmm. And those two players were Rod Brindamore and Glenn Wesley. And those two guys sat there like it was just another day. And there was some dejection with some of the players. There was some guys who were trying to make it light and get everybody kind of fired up. It's a new day. But those, And we talked to those guys on the way home, and they gave me every reason to believe that the next game would be different. Mm-hmm. And it was. So 2002, they make it to the Stanley Cup. They lose. I, I believe they finished dead last the following season. Yes. 2006, they win the Stanley Cup. I mean, look, yeah. you're 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 not necessarily a cap team like they are today. You got some difficult moves to you know to make, some decisions to make. You lose some guys through free agency coming off the of Stanley Cup. They didn't finish dead last, but they were damn near close to it in 2007. So this kind of created a pattern for the Canes during that time, and I think this is an important part of the conversation that I've been wanting to have with you. 
you see what the Hurricanes are doing now, where they've they're, they've made it to four str- as of this recording. Whenever you might be listening to this podcast, I don't know. In twenty thirty, you you discover it. The, the Hurricanes on their way to their fourth straight playoff appearance with actual real expectations. Okay, yeah, um, good. Real, which is great. It's great for the growth of the franchise. But the the problem with the Canes during this previous run is they'd make the playoffs and then go away. They make the Stanley Cup and then go away. They win the Stanley Cup, go away. Uh, and then obviously 2009, they go on another run. They lose in the Eastern Conference Final. And then they don't make the playoffs for 10 freaking years. So what What was the main culprit of the Hurricanes being unable to get any traction in terms of success during that period of time, especially with somebody like Jim Rutherford as the general manager, who we know can really work some magic, and we've seen that proof in the pudding. Because, yeah, you're you're exactly right. What you said there as you posed the question is working his magic under what circumstances. Um, you know, he, he needed to keep them as relevant as possible season to season. It's really hard to do. If you look at the elite teams now, Carolina, Florida, Colorado, just those three teams. Mm-hmm. Look at the misery those organizations went through for almost 10 years. Look at the first round draft choices they accrued. Look who they drafted and look at their rosters now. And that explains how you get to a level where you can go on a decade run of being close and maybe win a cup or two along the way. Um, The greatest phrase in sports is wait till next year, right? Mm -hmm. And it was really hard for the fans to believe that in Raleigh. Because what are you talking about? This is a roller coaster ride. You get our hopes up and then you stink. You come back and it's a little bit better and then you lose game 82 at home against a team you're supposed to beat to make the playoffs. There are a few years they're just a point or two away from getting in and couldn't get in, um, to be fair. And then there were some years they were just terrible. But Jimmy started operating season to season. He started looking for the dance partner that would – get them there because there was pressure coming from Detroit from Mr. Carmanis to do that. Um, It's very hard to tell Peter Carmanis in those years, Hey, we're going to put together a plan here and we're going to um, take some time to get to our goal. He didn't want to hear that because we're struggling to sell tickets. So we never had, remember, I think it was after they won the Stanley cup in 06, they only sold out the building 17 times the next season. Now, in most markets, to be fair, and I love that market, but in most markets, if you win the Stanley Cup, you're going to have 41 sellouts yeah. the next season. Yeah. But that didn't happen there for a variety of reasons because uh, hockey was still pretty new. It was. It went away for a full season. You canceled a season, and you expected it to just reappear in a virgin market like nothing happened. We lost people. And, and you know, people – Uh, you know, don't want to really lock in that much. You guys know this from uh, wanting to talk about the sport in those years and maybe on your shows not being able to because you don't get enough listeners. Um, That's not what people want to hear. They want to hear about the Wolf Pack. They want to hear about the Tar Heels. They want to really dig into college basketball season head-to-head with us. Mm -hmm. So we had to fight for all of that. And to fight for that, that's why Jimmy operated the way he did at the expense of losing draft choices, uh, having a cupboard that was pretty bare, my league teams that weren't very good Mm -hmm. uh, signings like Alexander Semen. I mean, these are things that, you know, you look back and and revised history and say that was stupid. But in the moment he was getting a so-called superstar to come to Carolina to play for, for a lot of money. But, but you know, that's, it wasn't the ideal circumstance for any free agent. You know, and that's why going way back, Ron Francis was important because he was the first guy that gave credibility to the franchise as a free agent signing. Well, I mean, that even extends itself to Rod Brindamore, uh, who, yeah. as you mentioned, in 2006 is the anchor of how that all played out, him and Glenn Wesley. Um, and now, obviously, his success as a head coach. But when he came over from Philadelphia, I, he pretty much had the same kind of reaction you did when you showed up in Greensboro for the first time. What the hell is this, right? Now, of course, he's, as I joke, he's, he's, he's practically an unofficial member of the Wolfpack. You know, he's, he's married to the family. He's talking about officiating the same way Wolfpack fans talk about officiating. 100%. Right? He's, it's great. He's, I mean, got he a, is, he's got to stop. He's got to stop. I think, I think it's funny. I think it's funny. It is. But, it is. Uh, but, I, but, but the point being, and, and maybe you can speak to this, at the time, 
as a team, maybe you don't necessarily want to be a part of it because the team wasn't necessarily good. But there seems to be something about this area that when hockey players or people around the league have come to it, like a light bulb goes on, like people tend to want to stick around here. Why do you think that is? I know I did. I mean, <laughs> well, yes, I know that. I know that. I, I you know, I, I, it, it's just a great place. I mean, and the players, one thing about the hockey players that, and it, my whole professional life has been with hockey is that um, you, you can't smoke them. You can't, they, they, they know when something is genuine. Mm-hmm. So there's a genuine feel there that um, is, is, is great. And it's not, uh, you know, just in that market, there are other markets around the league. St. Louis is another city that's uh, that where players get there. They live there when it's over. They love that area. Um, same thing, even in a short period of time, I've been out here, um, Seattle for big city has a small community feel with people. That's very, very unique. You almost have to see it to believe it. I didn't know. I never been to this place. Um, but I get it. I get it now. Raleigh's the same way. And, um, and that's why Rod has become the most significant figure in the history of that franchise is because he, he wants it to succeed in the worst way because he saw it as I did from the beginning. Mm-hmm. When you're kind of a pioneer, you want to see the, the the land of opportunity, right? And so that's kind of the way he looked at it. Absolutely. He would have told you it's Bush League. Um, I forgot who they were playing his first game with about 8,000 people in the rink. And he was like, you know, this is, uh, this is not Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is not uh, Toronto. This is not anything close. Um, but look what's happened, you know, over time uh, with great team success, look where you go. And then there's, uh, in playoffs, there's not a better location, really, when you get to the tailgating, the weather, and the, the loudness of the Kaniac Nation. And golf. Lots and lots of golf, which people... Lots of golf, which is always is always good, but just a nice place to live. Yeah. And, I mean, and that's all anybody needs. I mean, that's really what you need. I mean, the, your life is within the walls of your house, for better or for worse, you know? And if that's a beautiful thing, then... Uh, and it was for us. Uh, we raised our family there, and it was, uh, it was hard to leave, but... But that's the way it is, and uh, but a really, really good place. Who is, in your estimation, the most underappreciated Carolina Hurricanes player? Hmm. I mean, we know about Rod. You know, we, we understand Ron Francis's importance, you know, coming back to the team and uh, obviously being a, a GM there. So mm-hmm. um, who would you think is the most underappreciated? In the, in the early years, um, and maybe throughout his, his existence there, Glenn Wesley, um, because – you know, people will argue, and they did at the time, you know, really they're going to put number two up to the rafters, um, you know, because then they get into statistics. And yes. certainly in terms of longevity, he had that. But way back when, we we traded for Wes because he was a Bruin. Mm-hmm. And the Bruins didn't really come to the Hartford Whalers for any particular reason other than to beat them. Um, so, you know, to get one of them to play for us, so to speak, was kind of big. And that's the first, in addition to the Shanahan trade, those are the two big transactions in Hartford that Jimmy was uh, able to pull off. And then when we got to Raleigh, he was a settling influence for everybody. Mm-hmm. He was the father figure in the locker room. He was the one that bought in right away and said, this is great. Um, his family loved it there. He too raised his family there. Barb, his wife, a wonderful woman, uh, really became entrenched in the community. So those things were very important in terms of locker room. And some trades were made and that O2 group, you know, Arthur Zerbe, but I think he got enough notoriety. Ron Francis got a lot of notoriety. Um, certainly when you get to the next wave, um, I think one guy that was misunderstood, thrown under the bus, put on a pedestal was Cam Ward. Okay. I mean, because he was all over the place and he was a hell of a goalie and, and he played behind some really bad 
defensive teams and was under siege most nights. And in the 09 season, that second half of the year, I don't recall a performance like that from any goalie. That includes practice. Mm. The practices were great. He wasn't getting scored on in practice. It was like, holy mackerel. And then his back gave out yeah. because he was overused. And then a lot of people put blame on him, as you always blame the goalie or kill the umpire. Those are things we always do. Um, but I think he was a little bit underappreciated in that way. Um, Brett Hedekin was a – a stalwart for this team in the O2s run and obviously is a Stanley Cup winner. Uh, great hurricane. And uh, and Ray Whitney was a tremendous hurricane, you know, but you can go through that 06 roster and I'd probably rattle off everybody. All the guys. You know, Matt Cullen, you know, you go right down the list, yeah. um, you know, but but in terms of uh, um, uh, Eric Stahl got enough got enough notoriety for me. But I Great think he's player. a lot I think he's a lot Stall, Eric Stall is mm-hmm. a lot like Cam Ward in the sense that there was a raise him up but then because he was a part of lean years tear him down situation, questions of yeah. leadership and whatnot. Yeah, he was young it, when they won the Stanley Cup. Yeah, and then it runs in the family because to be fair, I know Jordan has had this renaissance. Yes. And and is a true but for many years the only guy singing the praises of Jordan Stahl was Rod Brindamore. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, he, you know, people weren't seeing the intangibles that Rod was seeing, and he would say, "This is not a surprise. This guy plays this way all the time." I remember that Adam Gold and I had done an interview with Jim Rutherford, the general manager, when the trade was made to bring on Jordan Stahl. And Adam, mm-hmm. and Adam has a particular way about him. You know this. I know this. And he and he let Jim know that he wasn't necessarily a fan of the deal, right? And Jim was probably, if I remember, if I remember correctly, Jim had been on national scene. He had been on national conversations. He had done NHL Network. I think he had done some other markets as well. And that, they're still looking at that deal as a oh, little old Carolina made a big old deal for Jordan Stahl. And we were looking at it from a, eh, is it that great? Was it worth it to give up this much? Yeah, well, if we didn't give up what we got, what we gave up, we wouldn't have him, mm-hmm. and he'd be playing somewhere else. So. You guys may think we gave up too much. I don't. Uh, uh, everybody in the hockey world that I talked to at the draft, every general manager felt that we made a great deal because it's very, very difficult to get a Jordan stall. Mm-hmm. They come along once in every 20, 30 years. So whatever we had to give, we gave. Um, and some people suggest, well, what if we waited a year? If we waited a year, he wouldn't be available because – one of the big market teams would have made a deal for him. They'd have offered him 20 or $25 million up front and a, a bigger contract than Pittsburgh did, and it'd be a deal he couldn't turn down. So the time was right. The deal was right. We're very, very fortunate to get him. We hung up the phone with Jim Rutherford, and Rutherford calls Adam's phone immediately after hanging up the hotline. And uh, it went to voicemail because something had happened, and, it, and he just... Jim let Adam have it, just like, I and I, I know you know this story. He didn't talk to Adam for a little he while. Did not talk, he did not talk to Adam. He would not no. go on the radio, and I remember no. I remember it was a trade deadline, I want to say the following season. I want to say yeah. it was the following season that Adam actually showed up to the little powwow that the Canes do during the trade deadline. I think we have the audio, so I'm going to have to dig this up. Adam Gold, wow, this was a special occasion. But Jim's like, oh, Adam Gold is here, like just yeah. roasting him because he just yeah. would not let it go. Uh, but I think that speaks to Rutherford's competitiveness. Uh, this oh, is yeah. the same man that they would do a media golf outing. You know, typically you do, um, yep. and I know you'd be a part of this. Uh, you bring the media out, they pair you up with some Canes players, you go play 18 holes, you get to know these guys, etc. Rutherford would take it very seriously as to who was allowed on his foursome. And if he didn't win the the media, the media golf tournament, you might not be invited back on the squad. This this That's affected true. people. I mean, he is he's a sensational golfer. Like he's a really really good golfer. He doesn't need a lot of help. But but I remember we had a little fun uh, putting contest before a charity golf tournament. I think Chuck was involved too, and uh, we're putting for for money. And Jimmy's sinking putts, and then I got very lucky. I'm just an average golfer, but I got I got very lucky with a couple of putts, and I started to push him. He got mad. 
And then I'm like, should I let him win? And I didn't. I my 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 lack of ability took over, uh-huh. and I and I started to fade under the pressure. But he starts to come on like he really is a competitive, fiery individual. Um, but he always comes back. Is um, we've had more than our share. He and I of high level heated discussions mm-hmm. um, about you know, my, my ethics of broadcasting, Mm. uh, not being enough of a Homer. Um, most of it came from Mr. Carmanis, who I also had had many run-ins with. And I, I respect the heck out of him because he always was fair with me and helped me out a lot. Um, but he would let me have it Mm -hmm. because he was over the top. And why don't you rip these officials more? And you're too nice to the league. And, uh, you, you got your own interest in mind. He believed that I wanted to be a national guy, uh, so much that I would, you know, do, do say great things about the league. And, uh, really that's not true. Mm -hmm. I just, that's not my style. So I would uh, dig in for that. And, uh, but Jimmy would always come around. He's a, he's a really, really good guy, but, uh, it's funny. I think Jordan and Eric share that they, they took a lot of heat in that market, um, for the team when they, uh, they really did a heck of a job in the season that Eric was traded out of Raleigh. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it might not have been his best statistical year, obviously not uh, anywhere close to championship level, but I saw a guy that just t- took a deep breath and said, I'm right. I'm going to handle this classy, classy, a hundred percent. He could have flipped off and uh, gone crazy on the media or whatever, but he never did very steady and very professional. With the remaining time that we do have, I did want to get back to your your broadcast. Uh, you as a play by play person, uh, and it's one thing that uh, I've always appreciated about you as I've as I've kind of come up in this business. And that you you did play it straight. You weren't being a homer on the broadcast, which I appreciated. Mm-hmm. And I appreciated all the times that you've done interviews with me and Adam, where if I asked you an opinion, I needed your opinion on something. You were not sugarcoating the opinion. Although over time, John, I did pick up, oh, John really doesn't like this particular thing because like you wouldn't go all in, like you'd take it up to a line. But if I knew you took it to a line, I'm like, oh, no, no, John clearly has strong opinions on this. He's just trying to make, be as professional as he possibly can. Little things that I pick up on from time to time. But you reference it there with with Rutherford and Carmanos, but is that something that you have dealt with throughout your entire career of just this is my ethics as a broadcaster and I'm going to call this game as I see it, whether it's a national game or for the team, I am going to keep it as level as possible, not be a homer. How, how much have you dealt with that throughout your career? Um, uh, uh, the entire time, the, the entire time, even in the minor leagues, mm-hmm. that's where that's where, that's where it started. Um, and I would get a lot of heat from my GM and my owner and my owner happens to be my agent today, believe it or not, my owner back in Springfield. Um, but yeah, I, I had some advice early in my career from Dan Kelly, who's the iconic hockey announcer passed away in the eighties, original voice of St. Louis blues and really the voice of hockey in my formative years on national television, Jimmy Roberts, again, the coach was a very good friend of Dan's. And before Dan passed away, I had this conversation with him and a lot of things that he said that day still resonate today. He talked about calling the game straight to build trust with your fan base. He said, it's the only way it's going to get through. If you overpraise too much, no one will believe you when it's really something good. So understand and tell your superiors that, you know, you're, you're, you're cautious with praise because when they they need praise and they get it, people say, Hey, Forslund thinks this is good. It must be good. Not Forslund always is saying things are good. So we can't believe him. You have to build that trust. And then there's the never uh, uh, selling down a goal or big save, regardless of which team it is. I I really abhor announcers that when the other team scores uh, and you're doing a home broadcast, you score. And then when the the home team scores, the team you're, you're broadcasting for, it's like the best goal that's ever happened, Mm -hmm. you know? No, a goal is a great moment for that player. Um, You dial it back down on a home telecast, a regional telecast, national telecast, obviously you sell it all out both ways. The same thing with a save. 
you, you never want to ruin that moment for the player. Um, that's the player's moment. That's a player's family's moment. Um, and if they elect to use your call, whether it be the league or as it goes now onto the internet and it marks time for that player, that player deserves that. And I've always felt that. So that's how I've done it. Um, I don't believe in ever going uh, unless they're absolutely out to lunch on the officials. I think they have a really hard job. I think all of these sports are really hard to officiate at the highest level. Um, I still have no clue how basketball officials do what they do. Um, (laughs) I have, and I know most of the fans don't, um, and, and the same thing in hockey, right? So why do it? Why cloud a broadcast with all of that crap? I, I don't, I don't get it. I never will. Um, that's, that's how I do it. But you knew, you knew with the Canes and you know, now with the Kraken, you know, who I work for when they score. Oh yeah. I mean, we want to uh, crack and won a game last night against Ottawa. It's like game seven of the final, you know, everybody was going nuts. I was going crazy. My phrases were coming out. Yeah. You know, I was sweating when the game was over. My tie was undone. It's a good night. So did you, do you feel that for the most part, Hurricanes fans understood that about you? No, some don't, and 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 some never did, okay. and some didn't like that I sound excited when the other team scores. No, I mean it, it hurts me, uh, especially when you're around a team for an entire season. You travel with them. Yeah, um, you're right there with them. You know, you, you understand who they are. You, you in some cases, you know their families. You know their parents. You know you. you there's a lot more emotion than just that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I may early out here in Seattle, it's funny, Joe, in the preseason, that was some of the things people would chirp at me on Twitter. And I immediately put it to bed yeah. and said, listen, I'm never selling down a goal. Thanks for watching, but you're never going to change me. Get used to it. Yeah. And it worked and it worked. And that's, and that's kind of the way it is, but I hope the trust factor was there. And I hope like when I, that's why I love coming on with you guys, because I thought we, for the most part, did a really good job. And with Alec after games, mm-hmm. Of, of telling as much truth as possible without getting really in a problem uh, from superiors in terms of, you know, getting in the hot water. Did the players ever say anything to you? Because I know sometimes Only, I know sometimes they might check out Aftermath or something like that. Did the players ever mm-hmm. say anything to you? Mm-mm. No. And if I say something, I'm pretty sure that I'm responsible. Mm-hmm. So if you're irresponsible, they have every right to go to you. But if it's an opinion based on being there every day, being at practice every day, being around, they understand you're doing the work. I'm not out on the golf course and then blow in and do the game yeah. and have like endorsement deals and think I'm the greatest thing in the world. And, and you guys, I don't really, they figure that out. Yeah. They figure out who you are first. They might not agree. They might go home and say, can't believe John said that, or John's this or that. I'm sure that's happened, but never to only once to my face, I had a run in with a player back in Hartford. Okay. And his name was, and he, God rest his soul, he's passed away. Zarly Zalapsky was a defenseman involved in the Ron Francis trade. And he was a tremendous player with great skills, but never, never could get a lot of traction as what he was supposed to be. And uh, anyway, uh, I made a reference about his play once doing color with Chuck, where I said, um, Zarly plays Chuck like a guy, and this has been used before, that has all the tools, but no toolbox. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I forget. And a lot of people have used that. Well, at the Christmas party, uh, he confronts me at the Christmas party. He said, I got an issue with you. You know, why would you say this? Who the hell do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. His wife came over and said, what's going on here? He said, I'm talking to John. I don't like what he said. And she looked at him and said, you know, the problem is there's one problem here. He's right. (laughs) And it was the end of the conversation. I said, Z, why did we have to do this at Christmas? <laughs> and he's like, hey, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's a really great guy. Uh-huh. Um, that's the only time, and I'm sure there have been, th- but I can live with it. And that's why I keep separate. I've never, aside from a few players, um, but even those players, I've made sure there's a line. I'd love to be over on Sunday and have a cookout, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to do it. Um, I kept my distance from coaches. I keep my distance from general managers. Um, even in this circumstance out here with Ron, I'm around Ron a lot. You've known Ron for a very long time. 
That's right. Ron and I had dinner in September here in Seattle before any of this started. I may have had, have had three conversations with him since. And he's on the plane and he'll turn around. And if it's a good night, he'll give me like a wink and whatever. And I, I think the world of him, but I don't need to be in his face. I don't need to be going out to dinner with him mm-hmm. because it clouds my viewpoint. There's there, there, in this job, there is some loneliness attached to it because you got to be, I think others don't agree. Oh, others I- will be right in there. Right. And you know, the pom poms are out and I can't do that. I, I just, I, I just can't do that because I think it ruins it for your presentation in terms of what you're trying to do for the fans, mm-hmm. because what we're doing is for the fans. Really. It is for the team. It is for branding that team, but that's how you build your fan base. And if you're not real for your fans, they're not going to spend their money on your product. That's what some of the people that are in management don't get, Mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't understand that that's how this works. You know, if your fans believe you and it's a good show and good radio, good television, they're going to purchase tickets. Yep. That's how I feel. No, I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with you. It's funny. You mentioned your phrases. You drop a that's hockey, baby. Did Last drop, night, yeah. Did you drop that on one? A, on, okay. a Victor, on a Victor Rascal, believe it or not. Oh, <laughs> Another <laughs> great moment in time, <laughs> yes. Wow, that's like an alternate yeah. universe uh, in oh, Kane's yes. history, right? Um, that, was, that was an organic one, the That's Hockey Baby? That just kind of came out one day? Got, it only it, it came out organically. Okay. It just came out organically, and it still does. And it's got to be – it's just whenever instinctively I think it's a great play. Yeah, sure. so that's it. Yes, but, that's it. But hey, hey, what do you say is actually yes. a tribute to your father. Right, right. And that was my dad's phrase. Mm. And when he passed away at the age of 59, uh, the day I received my first paycheck mm. in 1985. And anyway, that season and maybe the following season, I was just figuring out how – to use that phrase maybe. And I did. And then I started to use it more and then it became a personal thing. And then uh, the team won two Calder cups at the end of my run there. And that's when people started to hear it. They were actually listening to the radio broadcast, mm-hmm. except for in the past, just my owner would listen sure. and maybe my wife. And then they stopped. And that was about the extent of our listening audience for a long time. Because that team, too, never made the playoffs my first five years, yeah. but then won the Cups my last two years. It's funny how that's worked around my career. But anyway, um, <laughs> people asked me about it then, and then I finally told the story. But that one is totally, totally planned out yeah. and a tribute to him. Okay. Okay. And that was something that – because you're – was it was, – that was, it was something you would say – what was it, Little League, right? Little league. Yeah, he would, he would he would meet you, Joe, and say, "Hey, Joe, hey, hey, what do you okay. say? How you doing?" He coached us in in youth baseball, and he would say that all the time on the field. I started to say it. Um, that's that's where it came from, okay. and that too has been uh, criticized by cynics and people. Oh yeah, that's hokey, and who's this? And I never. Because it's a personal thing, I never, I would never even no. explain it. No, hokey, so. John. Hokey is uh, listening to me, and and fulfilling my request to say a Brooklyn son when uh, looking yes. at the set, at the skyline, or or when Greg McKegg scores a goal, and I asked you, hey, yeah. if McKegg scores a goal tonight, can I get a keg stand? Right? That's yeah. hokey. Okay, that's my yeah. fault. That's hokey. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> but that's why you're an absolute pros pro. We'll wrap the conversation. Here, um, your your enthusiasm for hockey, uh, your enthusiasm for the sport. Um, did did people realize until social media put it out there? Did they realize just how energetic you were in the booth at PNC yeah. Arena? No, I don't. I don't think people read that about me. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't think people because you're dancing, see me. you're moving around. Yeah, people. Don't, it's it's starting to um, gain some traction here now. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think they just. I did the Macarena last night on the scoreboard. <laughs> um, they have a they have a uh, 
really an awful rendition, by the way. I don't know if there's any good ones out it's, there. It's got to be a rights-free edition. That's probably so why it happened. It's not something that's normally done at Climate Pledge Arena, <laughs> but for some reason, between periods last night, our game ops people threw on the mark uh, the uh, Macarena, mm-hmm. and we have the twins scoreboards, the two scoreboards. It's kind of unique here, beautiful video yeah. boards. And the POV cameras in the booth, and I was doing my thing. And anyway, they switched to me because they in the control room they can see it all. So they had me and the crowd, and I got it going. And it was anyway. So that's me. Yeah. And you have to really know me to see that. Um, as Joe broadcaster early in my career, that never came out. Um, but then you get a little bit more comfortable, and then you don't care, and then you kind. Of, but in a good way, you know what I'm saying. As we get older, we become like that. When we're younger, I look at my younger um, um, methods, and I was like most young broadcasters. I was here to tell you that I know everything about this game. I'm I'm over prepped for this game. Yeah. I'm going to give you every ounce of information I have for this game mm-hmm. at the expense of the game. And I tell young broadcasters, please don't do that. But nobody really gets that. Um, you know, I prep ad nauseum and use very little of it, um, but it's there, right? So. But I wanted to close on, you know, you mentioned critics. You know, you go back to Hartford and you got the media critics. Uh, you, yeah. you have your, your time here in Seattle now. Uh, where people will chirp at you on social media. But I'm, I'm guessing that, and, and kind of the, the whole point of this podcast series that I'm doing is, I'm guessing you've had more people come up to you and thank you for mm-hmm. your contributions and helping them be hockey fans. It gets back to the, the enthusiasm of what I was getting at. People see how much you love the game, and it comes through in the broadcast. It helps them also appreciate the game. And I'm guessing you've had more people come up to you and tell you that than not. Well, the, one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me was uh, March 6th in Raleigh um, when they did that tribute. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if they wanted to do the tribute. I don't know if they needed to do that tribute. No, they needed um, to. I was, in, I was in the building for that game. I had Kelly and the kids with me, and I took pictures of the scoreboard and everything. I was very happy to see. I'm glad they did that. They should have done that, so I'm glad that happened. Well, here, here's why. Because when you leave like I did without saying goodbye and without having a real end to what I thought was a decent career there, um, you, you, um, feel like it was for naught, you know, and I had a lot in three, almost three years, I had a lot of those feelings. And when you live by yourself, like I have this season, um, all you do is think, right. And so when you, when you think too much, you wonder what's, what's this going to be like, and, um, you know, we, I had a nice chat with Adam at the beginning of the week, uh, going into that nice uh, chat with Chip Alexander going into that game, but I really didn't feel good about going there. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. Here's why Joe, I, I've, I've done games there after this was over and I've certainly done national games there, uh, but I've never done a game against the hurricanes as an announcer. I've never been in the visitor's booth other than to say hello to my colleagues there. I've never worked with the secondary crew instead of the A crew that does the hurricanes broadcast. So those were all different dynamics I had to digest. And then when the people reacted like they did, and I saw that, I was like, wow, this really is great. It kind of closes the book um, and we move on. But it was uh, it, it, it really resonated with me that what I did there uh, was to promote hockey, was to promote what I think is the greatest game in the world because I have to think that way. Not everybody's going to agree with me, but if you give it a chance, you might get hooked on it. And uh, we had some great players over over the years that were not only great on the ice, but great for that community while they were there. And that's what I tried to do. And I have a lot of friends like yourself there still do. And um, that's never going to go away. But you wonder about it when you kind of unceremoniously leave a place like I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot's been said about it. Who cares now? Right. But um, that's, that's kind of, uh, that was, uh, that, resonates with me as a, as a, one of the great moments of my career. Cause you don't, you don't get that, you know? And, and I saw, I've seen the videos, people sent them to me mm-hmm. um, because I couldn't digest it. I got very emotional. Uh, I was a little choked up during that thing, but I saw even the players, some of the players uh, tapping their sticks. And then our guys on the tarmac, as we left to go to Toronto, our players. And remember, this has been a weird season because of COVID. Yes. Um, I don't have a lot of strong relationships with Kraken players 
players yet. They know me, but we haven't had one-to-one contact with them, even if we're traveling with them. So weirdest thing. So they would come up to me on the tarmac and some of them had no clue. They had been there that long. Some of them knew, but every single one of them from the coaches right on through said that was a great moment for us. And I was taken back by that. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So that was great. John, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. A brief history of triangle sports sponsored by copiers. Plus your local office equipment and solutions provider. Take the mystery out of your printing expenses by scheduling your free print audit today at copiers plus.com.